Uh, good morning, uh, once more, colleagues. We want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this uh, press uh, briefing, as it were, or press conference of matters that uh, the panelists here with me will expound on. Like we mentioned, the issue uh, good morning, uh, once more, colleagues. access to information. Now, uh, challenges have been there on access to information. Remember access to information as a, I mean, as a principle, largely was started as something that was being pushed by World Bank as an accountability measure. So for quite some time, a number of our governments resisted an access to information uh, law simply because they thought it's, it's an corruption. But increasingly, as, and studies have shown and colleagues working on the matter talk about it. Access to information is an enabling law. It's an enabling uh, policy uh, related framework that if embraced fully helps in a lot of things, including allowing people to make decisions to invest, decision to go for, uh, to look for services and other things. So it's purely a human rights thing that would enable if it was respected. But obviously it has been getting more challenges, not because we don't have a law, but increasingly because largely of culture that while we, we pass the law, but a number of people in decision-making, most of our public institutions still old school and are still stuck in a culture of secrecy where you still find even things, obvious things like newspapers are still stamped private and confidential. So we are, as we address this matter, we're also looking into how do we loop in uh, our colleagues, especially public service and account governments to start embracing this law to help in the economic and related development that it's supposed to help. And, and obviously helping people actualize a number of their rights. So without uh, going into much, as we are aware, a number of our colleagues took uh, a petition, obviously related to COVID-19, but it's, once it is done, it has bigger implications. It will help in families, individuals, and Kenyans at large. So without going too much, I would welcome, obviously media as a media person, media will be the biggest, uh, I mean, uh, benefit uh, from this, if it was because a number of counties I'm aware, I will not name them, but we have six counties actually, which we are having challenges with journalists. They asked very basic information, how many ICU beds, how much money has been spared for COVID related and up to date, three of the journalists were beaten up and roughed up by the county governments. Uh, and, and others. So it's an issue that also been, uh, mean, uh, uh, interests journalists at a big level. So, so I would quickly then welcome uh, my colleague, Nerima Were, uh, to, uh, to, to then you. give us <laughs> a background, introduction of herself and what they are doing on the matter. So Karibu San. Um, good morning, colleagues, and thank you very much, Victor, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Nerima Were. I am counsel for the first to eighth petitioners in this matter, as well as the 10th petitioner. And I work within an organization known as Kellen, the Kenyan Legal and Ethical Issues Network on HIV and AIDS. Um, as to borrow from the words of our president, we are in, in unprecedented times. And as a result of that, we do require a different way of working and a different way in interrogating how we work. And this is what this petition seeks to do, really question how information is being made available to persons, how information is, how information is being made available and what information is being available to ensure that we are able to guarantee both the life and health of Kenyans. As the coronavirus numbers are increasing daily, both in terms of deaths and 
um, active cases, we have to ask ourselves, do we have the necessary information both to prevent infection, to promote healthy behavior, social distancing, and other restrictive measures that are being put in place, and to prevent death eventually, which has happened to already over 160 people in this country. And these are some of the questions that this petition seeks to ask. What information must be available proactively? We're in a pandemic. Why should the state have told us proactively without us having to ask? And if it's not provided proactively, what obligation does the state have to ensure that when you're asked for information, which we have done in a number of letters to the state as organizations and as individuals, that you must respond either within 48 hours or 21 days. If your country is in a pandemic and you fail to ask, provide the information necessary to ensure that the virus does not continue to spread, how then shall we be able to arrest it or seize it? Further, if citizens ask you for information that necessarily should be made available because we are paying our taxes, we have voted you into these positions, how should you react to the, those requests for information? So these are some of the questions that are being asked by my organizations and the first to eight petitioners. The first, second and third petitioners are community health workers and volunteers working in Kisumu, CIA and Mombasa County. Each of them consistently have questions from their citizens, from the residents within their counties on what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to prevent, to prevent infection, but also to access other health services. Mothers are staying at home because they're unable to access health services because they don't know if they can go to hospital or if they should stay at home. Children are not being vaccinated, both in Mombasa County and Nairobi County. And these are questions that are not being answered either by county or national governments. The fourth to eighth petitioners were persons who were held in mandatory quarantine. Each of them had traveled back into the country. And upon arrival, they were told that they would be held in mandatory quarantine for 14 days with no other information. They didn't understand what the protocols were, when they would be tested, how they would pay for this quarantine, what would be made available to them when they were in quarantine, how they would be provided for other health services if required. So they spent 14 to 28 days within quarantine facilities not knowing what was happening, not being given the information necessary to ensure that they were healthy and not also being told what it meant. Some of them were even held further and told it's because they didn't observe social distancing without the state having put in place protocols to guide social distancing within a quarantine facility. Such problems are necessitated because we are not providing citizens with information when they ask for it. The Kenya Legal and Ethical Issues Network on HIV and AIDS, as I mentioned before, is a right to health organization. So we work to promote and protect the right to health in this country. The right to health is threatened at this time. We are in a pandemic, yet we remain in a position whereby we do not have the necessary information for ourselves as an organization and also to provide to people that we work with. We cannot tell you left to right how many ICU beds, as has been mentioned, that are available how many healthcare workers have been trained? How many healthcare workers have been trusted? How many healthcare workers have necessary protective equipment? How many citizens have necessary protective equipment? How many commodities are available at this stage? We have a breakdown of large sums of money being received. We're unclear how this money is being spent towards protecting the health and lives of Kenyans. So we remain concerned that 10 years of, after our constitution, we've been given these aspirations and promises. We cannot go to the Commission for Administrative Justice to ask for information and get meaningful responses. We cannot go to the Ministry of Health to ask for information and get meaningful responses. We cannot keep drafting constitutional promises if we do not mean to, if we, don't mean, if we do not mean to meet them. So what we do have to ask is a court to determine and to decide, what does it mean when we have this provision in our law? What is the obligation placed on the state, state agents and state ministries? And what is the role of the Commission of Administrative Justice to ensure that Article 35 is realized? Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Fana. Thanks. Uh, without wasting, I'll go to, straight to Lempa. <clears throat> yes, uh, my name is Lempa, uh, litigation counsel at Katiba Institute. And we are in this petition because if you look at the petition, it's because uh, it, it, it seeks to <coughs> enforce the right to uh, information uh, because uh, information is very important in, in the running of, of the, any democratic uh, society. Um, this uh, right is closely tied to uh, the right to expression because if you look at uh, the right to expression, 
Really, would someone who is ignorant of information be in a position to express him or herself? Katiba Institute champions the, the, for the rule of law and constitutionalism. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank where, uh, the, 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 my, the, the speaker who has spoken uh, before me in saying that uh, we pay tax. I would like to say, uh, to add to it that uh, all information that is uh, held by the state or by state officers is held in trust for the citizens because citizens pay taxes and that information is either generated or developed through taxes. So anytime a citizen asks for that information, the citizen is asking for information that he has contributed directly in generating. And therefore, the state cannot be heard or any state officer cannot be heard to say that this is information is not available to you because it is held in trust for the benefit of the, the citizen. So therefore, uh, Katiba Institute finds it very necessary at this particular time when uh, the whole world is grappling on how to deal with the uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus to have all the information that is necessary for the citizens to be in a position to, uh, to be in a position to use this information to take care of themselves and to take care of their families. The Ministry of Health and any other government institution that is in custody of any information must know that that information must be consumed to the people whom it holds that information uh, uh, in trust for. So therefore, we, we, we pride ourselves as Katiba Institute to partner with other institutions because we believe and we know that any change in the society requires broad coalition of actors. It cannot be Katiba Institute alone, it cannot be ICJ alone, it cannot be Kenyan alone. A, a broad coalition of actors must come for them to create the requisite impact for even those whom doors are being knocked to provide certain information to realize that this information is really important. And we, we also are in this petition to share our experiences and our, our, uh, our experiences in court uh, because we've been in the forefront of uh, not only enforcing the right to uh, receive information but other, other rights in the constitution. If you do not have rights if you don't, do not enforce your rights, you cannot participate effectively in discharging your civic duty as a citizen. We believe and we hope that with time, when civil societies and other actors join hand, the impact is greater. And that is basically the reason why we are in this petition. And uh, the, we, we, some of us were really uh, sad when we saw uh, the state stigmatizing the dead in the burial that was in, in, in I think, in, in, uh, in, in Nyanza, where the dignity of the dead and the dignity of the family. The, in law, we, we normally say that a dead man has, uh, the, the, a dead body is of no, uh, has no value to, to some extent in law, but we know our culture and the stigma. If, if we stigmatize people by the, by, by the way we, we handle the dead, it's very sad in that the right to culture is one of the rights that was not in the old constitution, but right now it's in the, in the new constitution. And therefore we believe that uh, COVID-19 is, is not even like HIV, which is, is associated with personal behavior. This is a, 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 a pandemic that anyone can get in that it is, it, 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 uh, it, it's, it's not, you, you, you need not to behave in a certain way, not to get it. Although there are precautions that we are told uh, to take, but over and above stigmatization of patients or victims of COVID-19 and even the type of death that have arisen as the state tries to enforce the protocol is something that has 
cannot go unchallenged because uh, uh, generations to come will actually ask us what, what happened when this was happened. So Katiba Institute would like to be in that group of people who uh, challenged the, the, the system and the way they enforced the protocols and they, uh, they, they, they would like to have as much information as possible for that history to be as accurate as possible. Thank you very much. Asante sana, Vincent. I'll quickly go to uh, Teresa Mutua Karibu sana. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Teresa, as you've heard, Teresa Mutua. I'm a program manager at the Kenya section of the International Commission of Jurists, which we call ICJ Kenya. And we appear in this uh, petition as the 11th petitioner. And allow me to say that ICJ Kenya um, is a human rights organization. And we pride ourselves in that our contribution to the society is based on our legal expertise and international best practices. And why I say this and why it is important is because the reason we're in the petition is because we are disappointed that while as jurists, we participate and we contribute towards the development and even review of laws and promotion of laws, as Lempa has said, constitutionalism and the rule of law, we are saddened that while we have laws that are uh, good laws, 35, Article 35 of the Constitution on access to information, the Access to Information Act, which ICJ Kenya contributed and the rest of the organizations and joined in this suit and many, many more, we contributed towards the development of these laws and they are quite good laws. But we are disappointed that the government and the state, which has their responsibility in our constitution to observe, to promote, to respect the rights of Kenyans has gone ahead and violated these rights and has not taken steps towards the fulfillment of these rights and many others which we have um, um, talked about in the petition, including the right to health, the li right to life, the right to dignity, security of a uh, person, which are supposed to be enjoyed by Kenyans, which is why we are in the petition. Now, as part of our contribution, when we saw during the COVID-19, the way the government was responding to it, we were alarmed by it and we joined other civil society organizations in writing several letters that span over the month of April and we questioned some of the actions of the government. So for example, we questioned the uh, quarantine and the mandatory, um, the way they were conducting, implementing the mandatory quarantine uh, uh, response and we questioned it because uh, as Nerima has um, talked about, we were worried that they were using methods that put Kenyan citizens to much more danger. They were mixing uh, people, for example, who come from the airports who have not been tested. And so people who are positive of COVID-19 and people who are negative of COVID-19 together and without uh, being mindful of their health and their life, the manner in which they were containing these people uh, also was not right and is not in adherence to international best practice and the right to life. They were not giving information, which is key. They were not giving information as to how they are going to conduct this quarantine. In previous letters, we have also written to them questioning uh, the extension of the quarantine period. They do not give that information and Kenyans will know that what information we have been receiving is how many people have been tested, how many are positive, and we receive those quite a bit. But the information, even as Nerima said, how many beds? Count is telling us, how are they prepared? How are they um, testing? How are they putting these people in quarantine and ensuring that they do not even reinfect each other? And those are our worries, among many others that we have written in the letters, which you will have access to. And the issue for us as ICJ Kenya is we have come up and we are asking the courts to make a determination that these rights have been violated, that the state has abrogated uh, its duty to one, provide information even without being asked by Kenyans to do so because it is demanded by the constitution that they do so. And number two, that as petitioners, 
that we wrote to the state different ministries and departments and that they have failed to respond to our um, letters and information requests for information and that those should be pronounced as violations and that the court should demand of the state to answer the questions and the requests for information that we have sent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Uh, I'll go uh, straight to the executive director for Transparency International Kenya. Sheila Masinde, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Victor. I will give uh, the reasons why Transparency International Kenya is uh, part of this petition. Access to information is a right that TA Kenya has advocated for actively in the last 20 years. And we have been on the front line of advocating for legislation, which we now have together with CSO partners here and are now monitoring the implementation of the law. Uh, we have also taken other matters to court before to push for the right to uh, access information, working towards a corruption free society. Information on the use of public resources is particularly paramount to us. Now, one of the main challenges we have experienced during this uh, COVID-19 crisis is lack of uh, access to information. Having presented joint requests as has been articulated by my other colleagues from our partner, partner organizations, uh, we've presented uh, various requests to the Ministry of Health. And unfortunately, all the requests to the Ministry of Health are yet to elicit response, even just a simple acknowledgement. Um, that a letter has been received. And even in instances where we have sent repeat uh, letters, request letters, or sought the facilitation of the Commission on Administrative Justice uh, through the Information Commissioner. And as has been articulated, the requests have touched on a number of issues and particularly uh, dear to, to us as the Transparency International, given our mandate was on the was issues around the use of uh, funds, uh, targeting response uh, measures. Particularly, we had asked, uh, we, we had were interested in uh, responses in regard to the implementation of mandatory quarantine, including information on financial costs that had been allocated for uh, for quarantine and why Kenyans were being asked uh, to pay this off their pocket uh, at the beginning. Now, all the access to information requests made by us and by our partners have been premised on the life and liberty of Kenyans. Now, during this unprecedented crisis, it is very crucial that all accountability mechanisms remain effective, particularly the, the right to information, and which has a potential to play a responses uh, to COVID-19 and the transparency and accountability mechanisms that we put in place today will greatly determine how we recover as a country from this crisis. So that is why we'll continue to ask critical questions and ask uh, for information in regard to accountability and transparency. The public has a right to know what policies and decisions are being to combat the spread of the virus and how they can engage and participate in these decisions, but they cannot be able to effectively participate without information. And our prayer is that all institutions involved must be transparent in order to respond, respond effectively to uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis. And requests which are particularly about accountability should not be ignored during the crisis as they are very material to the protection of human rights and freedoms and the provision of critical services. The current emergency presented by COVID-19 does not allow government to act outside the frame of the law, it must conform to the constitution. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, quickly go to Achieng, Orero, Staff Watoni, Women's Link Worldwide. Achieng Karibu. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Achieng Orero, as you've been told. I'm a staff attorney for Women's Link Worldwide, and I am on this petition as a 13th petitioner. And my role particularly is to highlight the gendered effect of um, the government's actions or inactions um, to provide information that is transparent, that is accurate, that is complete, and that is timely. Those are elements of the right to information that cannot be ignored, and particularly with regards to how it will affect the right to health. As my colleagues have mentioned, women and girls are the majority of you know, health 
uh, of people who are offered health services at public health clinics, private health clinics, whatever the case. Um, and the impact of the lack of access to information that is there on women and girls must be addressed by this government. Um, we have seen high ranking members of the government uh, ceding to the fact that the increase in sexual violence amongst women and girls has been unprecedented, including the president himself um, in the address he gave on Monday. And whilst we laud you know, the effort to ask the National Crime Reporting Center to look into it, there must be also a, the health impact, the health services that must be offered to women and girls across the board. Um, these services, whilst being available, if women and girls in this country don't have information as to where they can access these services, who is offering these services, the time that they're um, allowed to access these services then hinders um, them from seeking um, health uh, healthcare. Um, as my colleague Narima mentioned in the beginning, we've seen instances of women being afraid to go to hospitals um, at certain times because of the curfew that was um, initially placed. This has had a negative impact even for um, to the point of death for some women as has been reported um, in the media. So our role in this, my role in this petition is to highlight the fact that in the month of April, we did write to the Ministry of Health seeking information as to what reproductive, maternal, newborn health services are available, um, the comprehensive nature of these services, what time are they available, what time are they accessible, and as all my other colleagues have noted, not even a of receipt was received from the government. Um, we are here to say that in times of emergency and crisis as such, the ones that we are in currently, um, the risk of violence is increased. The risk of um, violence particularly to women and girls in, is increased. And the orders to stay at home um, while keeping us safe from COVID and all the COVID related issues, um, locks girls in with their abusers or suspected abusers, and they must have information as to how they can seek health um, services from various clinics. So we are here to um, re demand actually that the government be proactive in its role of providing information, particularly where the health of women and girls is at risk. Thank you so much. Asante sana. Thanks, uh, uh, Angela, and uh, I'm sure you are comfortable with Swahili sometimes, so, so, so <laughs> my right to culture. <laughs> now, <laughs> now uh, Okuma, you, you are, well, I think we want to, to, to go to, and thanks, uh, colleagues, I think the issue of access to information and why it's critical in whatever we are doing for both our work and uh, citizens and what government, in fact, it's helped a lot in government achieving what it's doing by sharing. So mm -hmm. it is coming and coming and coming uh, uh, from almost all the colleagues that we need to, to respect. We need to observe the right to access to information because it enables uh, people to do other, a lot of things that are even beneficial at the state. So I'll go uh, to Eric. And, and Eric, as you introduce yourself, uh, kindly help us understand uh, what work you are doing, how the lack of access to information has affected your work and what type of information that you have asked from the various state agencies and what we have not received. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just like you had, my name is Eric Okioma. I'm a community health advocate, as well as a person uh, living with HIV, as well as a TB champion working in the community. And you'll realize that uh, we are the end users of, uh, of this information. We are the people who create uh, demand for those services. And uh, you'll realize that uh, since the beginning of, uh, of COVID, uh, the issues of COVID-19, uh, the, the way things have been done, have, uh, uh, they've not been done as, as they should be. And you'll realize that um, currently as we, as, we, as we speak, we rely on that information to handle certain issues, let's say issues to do with, let's say stigma, and we have stigma and discrimination. We have people going for, going for services and uh, you will realize that uh, being community resource persons, we are very key in terms of uh, 
uh, ensuring people come to us, we have to refer them, we have to tell them what to do and all those kind of things. And currently, as we speak, it's becoming a problem because uh, handling the COVID pandemic uh, in terms of uh, even involvement, uh, information has been uh, very scarce on how we go out. And you know, information is that critical is a, something that is very critical in some of the decisions uh, we can make because we'll realize that uh, currently we even have mothers. Mothers are now are now going to the TBS in some uh, in our communities, other than going to to facilities because we really don't know how to go about it unless somebody comes and gives us a guidance. And probably that those are some of the critical um, issues that uh, we feel we need to have and then know how to handle the pandemic. And also, when you look at issues around imp implementation of right to health, on issues of what we have, what resources do we have, uh, do we have the PPEs, do we have uh, so that we go about our 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 duties in terms of as we continue sensitizing communities and actually also knowing the cost. Uh, you know, when you're implementing uh, rights to health, you also need to know the like the cost. What is there? You have to be part and parcel of that uh, that design aspect, the implementation, such that communities can have a, can have a, can have buy-in. So you'll realize um, that. Uh, if we had to have that critical information, we, it, it would be very key for us to talk to the users. These are the end users. They are the people who go to facilities. So without it, I think uh, we are, we, I don't think we'll uh, be able to handle uh, the pandemic the way it should be. And um, the other bit is that um, you'll realize that uh, now when people don't go to facilities, to, or to serve for services even at uh, different places, you'll realize that you end up incubating the, the, the pandemic and other aspects and the other things that can get out of control. Things like infection control of other, other, other diseases because people don't go to facilities. People don't get those services where, 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 where need be. And uh, this one becomes a, a big problem and uh, now mitigating it becomes a, a cost on our side. And uh, uh, also the other aspect is uh, when we look at, uh, when we look at uh, even purchasing, some of the things, the way they've been purchased, uh, no involvement, no engagement, no meaningful participation of uh, communities in uh, certain aspects, we are left blank. And uh, I believe that uh, the fighting the pandemic is everyone's business. And uh, we should be there, and we should be we should have the information, and so that we can uh, able to go about our our the business that we do best in our in our communities. And uh, you'll realize, just like I said from the beginning, uh, there are services which people get in facilities, like reproductive health services for our mothers and the other information that people get. And now because of uh, the way they started it off. Uh, the government started it off was not the right way because there, there are issues of around, we have stigma now. In fact, now we have uh, stigma as people, we have uh, issues to do with the TB, HIV, uh, COVID now, and all those kind of things. And the perception in the communities that uh, COVID is more of a crime than a, a, a health issue. And that is what is there. And uh, unless the government gives uh, Comes out with, uh, comes out and uh, brings the right information and engage the, the right people such that uh, we can, uh, we, we, so that we are, we are part of the, we are part of the, we are part of the effort. And uh, because of that, and and it was not forthcoming, uh, uh, despite several letters that have been done, requesting for all that information or engagement such that it can help us do our work. And uh, the information has not been uh, forthcoming. And uh, actually that is why you, the reason why we are in this, in this petition. Otherwise, I think uh, this is something that should be done uh, as much as yesterday. And I believe that uh, 
the government just has to come in and uh, accept, get, let us get what we really need so that we can save lives. Because even now, as we speak, we have entered a very critical, a critical uh, phase. For example, I can give an example of, a, like if you look at a county in Kisumu, a mother asking for an ambulance. It doesn't get an ambulance, it takes eight hours. And you realize that when, it when it's like that and yet the information they say, and those, some of those things people are supposed to get them at that in real time, those responses are in real time. So when you, you respond to, when people are just busy thinking about, uh, about COVID up there, the grassroots really suffers. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, thanks. Uh, I see I'm supposed to speak when looking at the time. But principally, uh, from the media perspective, uh, is at three levels. One, that quality, uh, quality content is the king, that people want quality information. In fact, there are now a lot of intervention on infodemics or something, but is it information that's of value? So journalists and media is concerned about quality information. So is, that, is there that quality information that can then inform quality content that would uh, help Kenyans make the decisions they want? At a national level, yes, there are the daily press briefings, get a lot of information, but is that sufficient uh, to help in other things? That's one of the concerns we have been having. So at a national level, yes, the press briefings are helpful, and they have been very helpful. But again, you also notice that not all uh, media houses are allowed uh, to, to, to participate. Now that's a challenge. Two read together with the Count Government Act, uh, you will start noticing that getting information, especially from the counties, has been a big challenge. Now, especially we are, we are moving to uh, home-based care and whatever it is, we have devolved as, they, as it were. So if counties are not giving sufficient quality information in time, then how are we assessing their readiness? It becomes also a big challenge and journalists have been struggling. A number of them have make, been making uh, block statements of we have 100 million set aside. But if you ask the details of these 100 million set aside for to do what, what are the specifics, you rarely get the information. So that becomes a challenge. In fact, in, from three counties, we have had journalists uh, being denied. In fact, in one of the counties, he was beaten up for asking these 100 millions that have been set aside, what is it for? So, so those are challenges. A number of them initially were talking about having set aside uh, facilities that are ready and, and with beds. But if, when journalists went ahead to ask deeper questions, so that lack of information, in fact, affects the national government in making the decision it's making, because if they are withholding this information, then they, they are not allowing the national government to make the right decisions. So the right to information becomes that critical. So while it, it's not allowing journalists to give fully quality information, it's also endangering the lives of journalists where they have been beaten up. Here we have three cases we have reported where journalists having asked for information were beaten up. You know, now again, it goes to other violation of other rights. The other a bigger challenge at a journalistic level a media is having is at this time, a number of media houses, uh, journalists are working from home. Now, uh, a number of our journalists are paid for the work they do. So if they are working at home and they don't access quality information to allow them to do the necessary stories, then again, that's affecting even their livelihoods because they can't get quality information, they can't do a story that can then get covered, I mean, covered by the media houses, at the end of the month, they're not paid. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle of violations of other rights. So access to information becomes very critical to journalists in the sense that it will allow them to get the right source, the right time, and do their, uh, and do their work. So that has been a, a challenge. Uh, three, as, 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 as we look at it, uh, is that media at this time, given the multiple sources of information, if we are not getting quality information, then the issue of credibility and reliability of even the information in the media becomes a challenge. Because remember, there is competition, obviously, as a business, the breaking news culture and the rest. So if, for example, the other uh, channels have already gotten information and released, and the only thing that now makes difference between liberal media and the online media is the credibility, quality, and the professionalism that is added in the media. Because, the, for example, the numbers, everybody knows the numbers. Once the, the CS reads the numbers, everybody tweets, every, every, every Facebook has those numbers. But what 
what in addition to those numbers, the deeper statistics, the deeper analysis and trends are needed by the media to help people who read even now those work for newspapers that this story will be read the following day. So if you don't have additional quality information, then again, it just becomes numbers. And that's what we're avoiding because the purpose of media is not just to, they're not pipelines, just to relay numbers. But what are these numbers mean? What are the statistics? What do they mean? What are trends? What so, so again, the, the issue of access to that information becomes very critical because media is a big ally in crisis and studies have been done that media, if used well, can help even government, especially in this phase where we are moving to public education and public information, that we need as much quality information out there as possible. And in fact, uh, the Media Council is running a campaign on, uh, for media supporting journalists, media houses, and they will produce stories. So without information, this investment will also be a waste because then why would you support somebody who will then get stuck with a story you wanted to do, but he doesn't have information. So it's the, the benefits of the government, national government, county governments, to share quality, timely information with the media to help them in where we are now at a stage of public campaign to help in mitigating the effects of COVID-19. So it's of the benefit to share. So I think that's largely per se. And I'll open it up uh, uh, for colleagues who joined in the, in the discussion. Uh, journalists uh, who are present, I'd want you to uh, ask our experts here and panelists to help us. Does the CS daily briefing qualify to be a proactive information <laughs> disclosure, for example? Does it qualify? And, and, and other related. So yeah, uh, and, and anybody who would want to give it a, a first? You want this work? Yeah. I see two, uh, two, two notes there, but they're not really questions, they're just comments. Mm -hmm. So that's why. <laughs> Any question for the people who have joined in? Nerima, for example, would the press, the, the daily press briefings qualify to be proactive disclosure of information as it were. Um, yes, so the daily press briefing is proactive and that is not prompted, but it's not sufficient. And that is why we've moved to court. And I think what we need to recognize is that it is important to build public trust in order to have a, an effective pandemic response. The countries that we have seen that have been effective in addressing the pandemics and have been moving towards flattening the curve have the trust of the public such that when you tell the people or when you ask the people to do certain things like wear masks in public, observe social distancing, work from home, they will trust that this is our state and they're doing it for our benefit. And because you have a relationship of good governance, we don't have this relationship with our state. We haven't had it. Because 2010, we sat down to renegotiate our social contract and we said that we wanted a different state, but our state has refused to change. They refused to meaningfully change how they engage with us as citizens. They don't want to tell us how they're spending the money. They don't want to tell us how many beds are there. They don't want to tell us how many healthcare workers have been trained, how many healthcare workers have been tested. Information that it does not make sense to withhold from the public. What would it hurt me to know that we might be behind in our pandemic response? That might make me more vigilant in my movement, but what I don't know, I cannot help. So when we need to, pre we need to prevent the spread of a disease, what we need to do is to have a state that is honest enough for the citizens to explain what is necessary from the citizens and citizens who trust the state. It is necessary for us to learn from other responses firstly, but also to learn from the history. We saw that the pandemic response of, of Ebola in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Senegal were hampered, if, or hampered massively by a lack of trust. Women would not go to facilities because they thought that the government was, was trying to spread Ebola. In a sense, they had much more maternal mortalities as a result of a failure to attend clinic, not because the clinics weren't there, but because they didn't trust that the clinics would cater to them. So continuing to build mistrust with your people will not help in any pandemic response. We will continue to disrupt normally health, normal health services. Women won't go to clinic, won't go to hospitals. We might have increased maternal mortality. We'll have a reduction in vaccinations of children under five. We'll have people not accessing 
contraceptive services and other necessary services like HIV services, TB services, only because we are refusing to tell the people where to go, how to go, when to go, and because we're refusing to be honest about where we are in the pandemic response. And this is a continuous problem with our government. It was there in 2010, in 1990, in 1963. When do they plan to change how they operate? Thank you. Now, maybe as, 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 as we move on, as maybe Sheila, would you help us understand somebody's raising an issue that getting information in McQueen, from McQueen County is almost impossible. They only see on Facebook and the rest. How do you look at it in terms of access to information on COVID as we saw, and the, the, then the county government act, I think it's very clear, uh, sections 94 to 90, something about access to information and how county governments must work to share information. Is it an ICJ? I know you worked with some counties to develop an access to information law at a county level. What, what would this help? Yeah, Victor, thank you. I think our we, we have the requisite laws in terms of access to information. Uh, we start from the Constitution, Article 35, um, which gives all Kenyans the right to any information held by the state. And of course, we also have the access to information law. And for the county government, we also are enabled through the, the county uh, government act, that you, as, as you have mentioned. And for, for us, and that is one of the reasons why we're going to court to also test the, 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 these this laws and ensure that we use the provisions that have been provided in the constitution and also legally to get the information that we require to exercise our rights and, and exercise and also get our rights and, and, and freedoms and also ensure um, services that should be provided by the state, particularly during this critical point where Kenyans need various services uh, to be able to secure their health, their lives and their livelihoods. We need information to keep going and also for us to also be able to make um, requisite decisions that protect us further as citizens. In the, during this COVID-19 pandemic. So for the county, um, I've, I've not seen the question, uh, but I think for, for, for whoever who is asking for that information from the county, I would encourage them, please go as far as you can. Um, I know that the challenge that we face right now is if we even in civil society, um, in, in, the, in the places where we are able to engage are not able to get information, then the critical question is then what about the common wananchi? Um, what, what do they need to do to, to access information? That is what we are asking the government and, and other authorities. Just follow the law. Um, because if we were struggling where we are to get information, you can imagine now the person in Makweni who's, who, who requires this um, information. Um, what do they have to go through? So, but I, I would say let us as citizens exercise our right. We have been, it's our constitutional right. and. So let us try as much as possible to get information, particularly as I, I'm concerned about access to information on, on, uh, on, on financial, financial information and the use of public resources. Just maybe to add on to what Nerima has said in terms of the, the, you know, the, the, the daily briefings. And we appreciate that, yes, we are being given information. Uh, you compare that with other countries and that is not happening. Uh, yes, that's a step ahead, but we need even to go further and give Kenyans critical information on monies that are being contributed and that are being allocated. So we get information on what exactly are these monies are uh, being used for. Because at the same time, as we get information that yes, monies are being contributed, um, are being contributed, we're also getting information that in some hospitals, particularly at the grassroots, and particularly now with the concerns about county preparedness, we are uh, and 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 to to enable our hospitals uh, uh, in the grassroots and in the counties also prepared. There are questions then: How are these resources being expended to ensure that all hospitals uh, have PPEs, have the requisite PPEs to also ensure that uh, our frontline health workers are protected? and services and health services, particularly in regard to COVID-19 cases are well addressed. So access to information is uh, critical at this point. Thank you. Will help us, it does, for example, the, the, the Facebook messages and that we get from Minister of Health on their Facebook every day, in addition to the daily briefing, will that because uh, Alice Kemunto here asks, what type of information do they need to help them? They, they have not understood even what the implication of the curfews and the rest is. Mm -hmm. Now, do, do, do the posting of the speeches of the president, for example, and messages qualify or is it helpful? Mm -hmm. Right. 
I see the comment by Alice and I think that goes to show that you see the information that we have received so far, even with the statement by the president um, is not sufficient so that uh, the citizens of this country can therefore use that information to influence and make decisions about their lives to protect their health. Um, and that goes towards um, why we're even in this petition as we are asking for information and this information must then result to citizens making better and informed choices. Otherwise the information is not useful. Now going to the Facebooks and the social media that they have been posting, I think we must recognize that that is a step, just as Sheila was saying, it's a step in the right direction that this information is disseminated, not just on TV, but also on social media platforms. But let's also remember that these social media platforms are not accessible to every citizen. And therefore it's not enough that this information is uh, disseminated in that way. What happens to my grandmother in the village who does not understand the English that the statement has been written? It is it being translated into a language that she understands. How are you utilizing, for example, community radio and community uh, other platforms where the community has access to this information? So let us remember that information and access to information is not just churning the information that we see the government doing. It is a step in the right direction, we agree. However, this information, for it to make sense uh, in, the, in the principles that Article 35 has uh, given us in the constitution, this information must be given in a form and manner that is useful to the citizens to make informed choices. And as we're speaking about COVID-19, then it must relate to their everyday life. If you say that the, uh, as Alice is, um, is, is commenting, if you say that now the travel restrictions have been lifted, what does that mean to Kenya? Alice is asking, can I travel to the village? So which means that the press statement by the president does not help Alice and the other Kenyans to make decisions about whether they should travel and what uh, health, um, uh, what health uh, uh, measures they should take in terms of protecting themselves and which measures the government has put in place to ensure that those traveling up country, those traveling into Nairobi and other areas where the numbers of COVID-19 patients continue to be on the rise. So what does that mean to them and what uh, measures has the government taken to protect Kenyans, even who are coming into these uh, 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 places where the number of infections continues to rise. And therefore to answer the question, that information is useful. However, it must be disseminated in languages and in manners that people understand, and that is sufficient to allow us to make informed decisions for the protection of our rights. Thanks, and just to, to, to indicate uh, now that I'm here, <laughs> that the government has given money to community radio stations, actually uh, 120 million to support nearly 149 radio stations and TVs across the country to allow debates and discussion on, on, on health COVID related. So again, uh, those of you, especially Okioma and the rest who are in the communities take advantage mm -hmm. of these uh, opportunities. And if you get any challenges, get in touch with the media council to connect you to some of those and even you your networks on the grassroots help us give uh, we will connect you to the, uh, to the community radio stations for discussion for free you will not be charged because government has paid for community for the next three months so that they help in the public education so away from that uh, vincent now that we have three cases of journalists who have been denied information and some beaten do you want to take up that matter on behalf of those journalists what is their right what do these journalists do of course, uh, Mr. Victor, as you said it, journalists require that information, first of all, to inform the public because journalists have the right to, they have a responsibility to inform, to educate, and to entertain the public as uh, the, the, the core, uh, the, the, the core uh, uh, mandate of, of the media. A journalist also requires information for him to uh, enforce his right to work and to earn a living. So, the, the, the civil and political right of receiving information is tied to uh, the right uh, to, to work, which is a economic, social, and cultural right. And therefore, any journalist denied that information has all the rights to, to talk to us so that at least we make the requisite noise 
uh, and if that noise is not enough, we can sue, we can uh, create uh, a lot of nuisance in court. You know, some of these cases, public interest litigation, some of it, sometimes we file for nuisance, but not most government offices and officers would like from time to time to attend court and answer questions. So therefore, any journalist who feels that he requires information and that that information is being denied, he has all the, the rights to, to, to talk to advocates who, some, or not even advocates, even other people. We have seen uh, Okoiti Omtata, one of the leading public defenders in Kenya, doing a lot of work, including advancing the jurisprudence on, 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 on access to information. So I believe journalists are well informed. They can talk to us. They, they, we can even uh, uh, train them on how to enforce those rights. If uh, the avenue for them to get an advocate is not available, it's possible. And uh, the, 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 the right to information, uh, as you put it, is very, very, very important in a democratic society because it is tied to other rights, like even public participation. As I had said earlier, how would you participate? Uh, in, 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 uh, how would you exercise your right to public participation if you do not have the information? Because the person who has the information will trample on, on, on any other person that does not have uh, information. And uh, on, on stigma, Okioma talked about stigma. It's very sad, very sad, because this stigma has a, an aspect of discrimination. And I believe you all know, you have seen it. Uh, there are some people, the rich, who have lost their loved ones, maybe may, may from other causes, but not necessarily COVID-19. And we've seen they require mass, mass lists. They are even more than 100 people, and they are conducted in a more dignified manner. But when a poor person dies in Muranga, in, in Kiabu, or in, in Nyanza, they are buried at night. While require mass are, are conducted for the rich people in a, in a very dignified manner. So uh, this COVID-19 has, has, people say that it has equalized people, but we have seen some aspect of discrimination in the way that uh, the poor people are, are forced to dispose of the, 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 their loved ones. So that's another issue that uh, we probably will be telling the court to, although we have evidence of it, including the, the, the annex that we have put in the epigraphic, we'll be telling the court to make, uh, to take judicial notice that this stigmatization and, and uh, disposal of, of the dead has some discriminative aspect of it in that some rich people are being buried with the decency that uh, we, we, are, we are supposed to dispose of uh, the dead. And uh, with the time, we've always uh, uh, been talking about contempt of court, contempt of, of this. I believe it's about time that uh, we also become very very creative in the way we, 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 we come up with the remedies. I think with the time we'll be asking the court to issue declaration that certain people are in contempt of the constitution uh, or, or certain people are in contempt of certain laws like uh, and the, even contempt of the citizen because a, a citizen a citizen demand for information that has been generated using his, his resources. And therefore, uh, if, if uh, the ministry cannot even uh, respond, we have, in, in this petition, we have five good letters, five good letters that have been annexed from April, uh, I think April 4th, all the way to April 21st. All those letters have not, been, have, have not been responded to. And that, that's a problem with the Ministry of Health because or, or from a, a, my own private uh, engagement with them, I know they do not even uh, acknowledge receipt of any inquiry you make on how, and especially on how sometimes they issue uh, those certificates for people with disabilities. Sometimes you write to them asking them how someone who was declared disabled has all of a sudden been declared, uh, been removed from that disability uh, criteria. They don't answer. They, they just don't. And I think the best thing is for us to be going to court to enforce those rights and create a lot of uh, nuisance to them because while they may ignore letters written by, by, by citizens, at least they would honor someone's from courts. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, Amos, Kemboy from uh, Masai Mara University. Mzalendo? Mzalendo Kemboy? Yes, I'm getting you, Mr. Buire. Yes, yes. Ebutu ulize kutoka naro kutusikia unatamaji. Um, I would like to inquire, first of all, um, how, what interventions have, have uh, we made to um, make uh, those information holders in various uh, government institutions that uh, ATI, access to information, is a critical um, aspect in, in ensuring that we have free access to information owing to the fact that uh, uh, most of them, or some of them may not understand the essence of giving out this information. The fact that they might not uh, understand the real classification of information from the critical confidential, so that uh, whenever somebody, or let's say a journalist or a, a, um, a civilian visits and uh, inquires for information, every information phase is critical. It, it doesn't uh, warrant uh, revealing. So, what interventions have we done so that uh, we can have um, civic education, both of those information holders, and also um, the civilians and also some um, journalists, because uh, they need to understand also why uh, once you've been denied information, what levels of um, uh, what levels of um, intervention are you going to take so that you can maybe get information from I and higher authority? Or how are you going to reach the appellant authority so that you can at least have access to, access to information on other platform? And uh, another question also is, uh, um, uh, as we, we forge, uh, as we go ahead, tunapo angazia swala hili, tunapo pia atuwa katika guli hizi, ze nimbinu gani itatusaidia hasa wakisha kwamba uhuru wa sambaza abari ama wale kukukia abari, watakuwa na uhuru mia filmia, kienda katika miaka zijazo hivi kwamba kusije kuko na kikwazo katika miaka zijazo ili kila mtu aweze kuwa na nafasi murua asante sana asante mzalendo kutoka narok i think uh, that question would also relate to one we got here in terms of classification somebody asked in terms of would the court maybe deny or look at the issue of what is classified information mm -hmm. and related maybe you want to give it a look? yeah um thank you so much for the question um, so in terms of information that is classified, this is why actually we have the Commission on Administrative Justice as a respondent, because this is primarily their role. They should be giving ministries, state agents the capacity to understand the obligation to provide information. That is why we need regulations in place. They have failed to do so 10 years of the, uh, 10 years of the constitution and they have failed to even make any attempt to address this gap. So we understand that there is a gap in understanding among the ministries, but who must address that? Because you cannot continue to collect taxes and then claim an incapacity on your part. If you cannot do the work, then don't, don't collect my taxes if you don't plan to actually play your role. And that's the Commission of Administrative Justice, the Ministry for Information and Technology, working with every other ministry to give them the necessary capacity to provide information to citizens. One, citizen, one information that is sought, and two, information to protect life and liberty, which must be provided within 48 hours. If CAJ had been working with the ministry before now, they would have had regulations in place that would have been able to tell the ministries, this is your obligation from step A, B, C, D. And your question is very important because you don't know. And the thing is, neither, neither do we. We don't know how long. If I send you a letter and you don't respond within 48 hours or within two weeks or within 21 days, I don't know what the next step is. Do I go straight to court or do I go to CAJ? This would have been avoided if CAJ had been doing its job of the ministry had been doing its job. Secondly, the act is quite clear that information can be classified and that any information that is classified may not be shared, but those reasons must be provided to you. If you ignore me, I don't know if that's why you're not giving me the information. You have to tell me that it's been classified. And then the act has to have regulations on how information is classified. Another thing that the ministry and CAJ have failed to do. So the ministry can just say, how we got the 10 billion, that's classified. What you're spending that 10 billion on, that's classified. Why? 
I don't know why it's classified and you won't tell me. So one is your failure to respond, then I don't know why you're not responding. Secondly, if you want to classify information, there have to be necessary steps that you follow. Thirdly, if you do classify it, you have to communicate why you've classified it. None of these things are happening. None of these things are happening because the Commission on Administrative Justice has failed in its mandate. The Ministry of Information and Technology has failed in its mandate. Ministries might not know but the failure to know 10 years of the constitution is no longer my problem as a citizen. They have to meet their mandate. Thank you. And uh, Achien, maybe somebody asks here, now that you went on, uh, I mean, your strength you mentioned is on gender and related. I mean, your interest in uh, issues of this petition. But somebody has also asked, um, would you uh, consider issue of disability? People with disability are also asking, would they be part of you are, you, are, you are thinking in, in, in a strategy, how do they access information? I mean, uh, so much information is being channeled out there, but is it disability friendly? Um, thank you for that question. And I think it's a very important aspect that we have seen um, the government has also failed to provide any mechanism. Fine, we have um, during any mechanism that um, can be used to serve the, the, the persons who are living with disabilities. Um, the right in ac um, to access information gives every citizen the right to access this information. Um, it's not stratified. Um, and where the government fails to uh, provide this right, then it's discriminatory. It's discriminatory against those who can't access mainstream, um, me mainstream methods of um, accessing information. Secondly, um, the government also has the proactive right to disseminate the information. How the inf information that they give um, is dis disseminated is their role. Um, it's not on me as a citizen to go on Facebook or to log into whichever um, channel that has been used to disseminate this information. It is the proactive um, prerogative of the government. It's their obligation to ensure that every right has, I mean, every citizen has access to this information. Um, it's not only to make sure that the information is available, but to disseminate it to the lowest um, levels, to the villages, to um, homesteads and all that. And particularly with regards to a pandemic, um, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, this information goes to the root of life and liberty. So um, COVID-19 does not discriminate, as we have been saying throughout the, the last um what, four or five months. Uh, it doesn't choose that it only affects certain members of society, even people living with disabilities, women and girls, the most vulnerable, the most marginalized members um, of the society have a right to access information. And it is the obligation of the government to provide information in the manner that um, all citizens are able to access this information. Um, and I think this petition um, is working to ensure that the court gives a pronouncement to that effect. Thank you, Ajian. Joseph, Joseph Wangendo, please. Joseph? Yes, you can hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I sent in a question earlier, but uh, I joined it late and my apologies. Um, I, I needed to find out, I work in the blood um, transfusion sector and uh, we know that uh, the funding from the World Bank, uh, which is a credit line, the 50 billion that was given, uh, the 5 billion uh, Kenya shillings, 20% uh, of it was supposed to be used by the blood transfusion service. Now, um, as far as I'm concerned, that service is actually not operational as we speak. And my concern is because it's a sector that's been, you know, um, there's a lot of corruption that's been going on. How are we going to make sure that this money, because again, it's borrowed money from the World Bank and we're going to pay it back. How are we going to make sure patients are dying? There's money we borrowed to help these patients access blood and they're not accessing it. How are you going to make sure that money that was lent to us is, is, is actually, I've tried to monitor in my role as, as a civil society, you know, and working in that space, but information is not accessible. You know, uh, the ministry shuts all the doors. Um, you know, um, the new CS, when he came in, appointed us on an advisory board, which was gazetted and disbanded within two weeks um, because I guess people didn't want us to access that information. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss uh, on how to get this handled. And I'm hoping, you know, part of the petition could 
could raise some of these issues. Thank you. Fundamental, and this one, uh, we have no alternative but to ask Sheila <laughs> to, 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 to help us in terms of how, what, what does Joseph do? <laughs> Sheila, yeah. please. Yeah, I don't know whether Joseph has um, his, um, in terms of uh, trying to maybe even just request this information. Um, that's a good first step. But as I said, that's one of the things we have done and we didn't get the information. And I, to, I mean, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but it, it looks like that kind of information cannot, will not be proactively disclosed. Um, I think here in and in, in pre, even for, for pre previous um, administrations, I think getting information from certain ministries, particularly Ministry of Health, has it's, it's like it's you know it's like pulling teeth really, uh, trying to get that kind of information on on financial um, on, on critical financial aspects. So my own recommendation is um, um, we, we hope that this will be able to, uh, this case will be able to set uh, the requisite precedence in terms of access to information including financial information. But I think in addition to that, there are certain things that we also need to be calling for. Uh, we've also raised concerns about the use of uh, how we're using borrowed money. We are acquiring debt that is going to be paid back by taxpayers' money, but we're not accounting for that debt. We are not showing or demonstrating how we are using that money. And it is important, and that's one of the things we're trying to also get government to do, all the monies that they're, that they're borrowing from financial institutions, such as the World Bank and IMF, um, need, to be, need, need to be well expended and well accounted for. And maybe one of the things that we need to also call for Joseph is ask that this kind of monies are subjected to regular internal audits so that we are also able to curb any loopholes before it is too late because sometimes we wait for too long before an audit is done but in, in fact it's one of the things that we've called for even the in the COVID-19 funds that we need to have a, a system of regular audits so that you don't wait for such a long time before you realize that something had been going wrong and by that time it's water and money under the bridge so calling for regular internal audits is one of the ways uh, in which we can be able to institute some uh, remedial measures to ensure that we safeguard um, our resources against any mismanagement or, or losses uh, from the onset and one of the things that we've also asked is that the office of the auditor general is 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 uh, more active and more alert in in terms of how we are using monies. Not okay. Of course, now for this particular period, uh, we have a special concern on how COVID nineteen funds are being used, and we've asked that they ensure that they are regular um, audits as well. But not just for this, but also monies that have particularly uh, been borrowed for, uh, be borrowed uh, to support different aspects of of development in this country. Thank you, Sheila. I think uh, we have a short time. It's interesting. We need to continue, but I am sure other people are in engagement. And I'm sure some of my journalists uh, and friends, the bundles are already threatening them. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to uh, Teresa to give us a wrap, and then uh, we, we, we open it up for another discussion another day. So, mm -hmm. Teresa, Karim. Thank you, Buri. I think as a way of closing, it would be prudent to just uh, indicate what the direction of the court was. Um, from yesterday, because yesterday we were in court for a mention, and the court directed as follows, that the respondents um, do respond to the petition that we filed within seven days from yesterday. The court also directed that we make our submissions as petitioners within seven days, and that uh, those respondents who did not appear, because some of them did not, that they are served by today. And the matter will then be mentioned on 23rd of July uh, so that the court can confirm that uh, all of us have complied with the directions of the court. Um, also in closing, I would like on behalf of the petitioners to just thank uh, the civil society movement because the number of um, civil society organizations that were involved are much more than there are petitioners. So we'd like to thank them and thank the civil society movement uh, working on health and rights uh, issues.
that came together and saw it fit to follow. And it's not just in this petition. We've done a lot of advocacy issues and we continue to do so. We shall not relent. We continue to do so. We encourage uh, callers like the callers from NAROC and the current caller that we've had to continue in this fight to demand because the constitution then uh, gives us the right to demand of the state to do their part. And so to continue demanding, do not uh, relent. Even when we do send letters and requests for information and they do not come through, continue to do so. And we have faith in our justice system and in our courts that they will find uh, the right decisions and that this will be a groundbreaking decision towards the implementation on access to information. Finally, we would call on the government and state uh, departments and ministries to go ahead and begin to give this information. The court does not need to say so for you to give this information. Give this information to the public, allow us to make decisions that are informed, to give the counties also opportunity to interact with their members, give this information to your citizens so that we are able to make information. Thank you very much. Asante sana. Uh, so on, this, on behalf of colleagues, once more, I thank you, those of you who joined and who, who, those who have been with us. Let's continue interacting, talking. There are Twitter handles there, there are Facebook. Uh, continue engaging uh, the panelists. They will answer your questions even outside this uh, formal press conference. Other than that, thanks and uh, uh, good day. Thank you.